Live from Barcelona, Spain, it's theCUBE, covering Cisco Live 2020. Brought to you by Cisco and its ecosystem partners. Hello everyone, welcome back to Cisco Live Barcelona 2020, kicking off the new year, of course, it's theCUBE's coverage of four days of CUBE action. All day, I'm John Furrier, Stu, my host, Stu Miniman, the two great guests, Thomas Sheba, Vice President of Cisco, and Yusuf Khan, Vice President of Technical Marketing. All things data center and networking, these are the guys. Guys, great to see you again, welcome back. Thanks. Thank you very oh, much. Always fun. So kicking off the show, I know there's some announcements coming, so we're going to save the good stuff for tomorrow and Wednesday, um, but a lot of new things going on in data center and Cisco ecosystem. Give us the update. Yeah, uh, again, thanks. thanks for having us on. So yeah, I mean, there's actually a lot of good stuff on the data center side. Uh, let me touch a couple of items. Right? Uh, one of we, we kind of started two years ago actually was Assurance. We're expanding our analytics portfolio, adding the insights capability. So we're, it's, the, it's the Assurance and Network Insights uh, tool set. Very, very cool stuff. Really focused on the network operator and was one of the messages we got. You guys need to help us here in these complex cloud environments. And so what we have is we built AC extensions for our fabric controllers, both on Nexus and ACI side. Same thing, pure software extension. And initial feedback from customers is very, very happy uh, what they see. So that's one piece. Uh, I don't know, Yusuf, you want to take a little bit on what we do with ecosystem partners? No, thank you. Yes, I mean, we are very excited also to announce some of the new integrations that we have with our ecosystem partners. And for example, ElgoSec and ACI integration, um, te Terraform for, from HashiCorp and ACI integration, um, continued expansion with our Splunk uh, uh, apps with the ecosystem. So these are some of the new things that we are working on. So that is excellent. And on top of it, um, I, Thomas, you can expand on it, but I think we are very happy that our 400 gig portfolio is shipping now, and we have customers in production on our 400 gig uh, portfolio. So that is uh, great news for us. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's actually a good point. You mentioned right. Splunk and Terraform, HashiCorp, you know, ecosystem partners. It's interesting, if you look at the performance of a lot of those companies, cloud was, is a tailwind for them. So because the consumption is a service, the customers are all embracing it, but it's not just public cloud, it's the data center now is back. So can you guys just share your thoughts on your um, environment with your customers because the software is the key, get it as a sub subscription or consumable model. What are some of the trends with the consumer, I mean customers in the data center because cloud and hybrid now is happening oh. and it's real growth. Oh, it's, it's absolutely happening, so yeah, I mean, Maybe a little bit of a why this is happening, why we're having some of these integration. You're absolutely right, cloud is happening, but really cloud means hybrid cloud, or for some customers, multi-cloud hybrid because they're going to have two different cloud providers. But it's really hybrid cloud, so it's really distributed data center. And so the interesting piece happens, uh, it's really two things that need to come together. There's this whole network automation analytics, which is how do I get from my data center into a cloud, and how do I treat this really like the utility. But that's the infrastructure, but then there's this front end, because what really drives us is the application uh, refactoring, and this is where the application automation needs to come together with the infrastructure automation, and so that's one of the reasons why we have this integration yeah. with, with Terraform, and the other one is like a Jenkins uh, pipeline tool. How do we actually take what the application was doing in the front end, and then seamlessly make this into infrastructure, which is like, as you probably know, the infrastructure as a code thing. Yeah. And that doesn't really matter whether that's in the cloud or on-prem, it has to work across. That automation is yeah. a huge thing. And, and, and it's so nice to hear, because Thomas actually, when Cisco first came out with application-centric infrastructure, I kind of looked at it a little bit, I'm like, well, come on, how much are you actually tying to the application? Well, it was Cisco skating to where the puck was going, and I think that the, the technology today and what you're talking about is closer to that application. We have, you know, we're here in the DevNet zone, we're talking more about those pieces, not just, oh, it's something that runs over the pipes and I've got buffers and right, you know, right, traditional right, right. networking pieces. So, no, and, uh, would you say that's fair that we're a little bit more application-centric today in 2020 well, than we might have been me, a couple of years ago? It's, it's actually, <laughs> it's a very good comment. I'm probably would spin it slightly different because I'm the pragmatic guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do we want everything at the same time? Absolutely, right? But you do have to put some of the building blocks in place. And yes, application-centric really meant more, we changed the configuration management scheme of infrastructure from thinking about network terms to using application terms. And that's really what application-centric yeah. means. It doesn't mean you change the application. It was more like change the paradigm, how do you manage infrastructure 
to not just automate, everybody does that, but actually have an abstraction layer that is meaningful to secure and apps people. Yeah, I mean, and you're the, right, it takes time to get there. In the end, customers and users are looking to deploy applications faster, manage applications better. Yeah. That's the whole purpose of building the data center so that we can host the application. So what we did is we introduced constructs that can help you manage those applications better, deploy them faster, manage the life cycle of those applications faster, and that's why we introduced the constructs. And again, I mean, going back to your comment in terms of like buffers and switches, it, we firmly believe that the plumbing, which is the networking, has to be state of art for us to abstract these things on top yeah. through software and exploit through software. So we have to have a best in class network and the switches, and then we have to have build the abstraction that we can exploit through the software means, right? right. And also that highlights some the partnerships that you mentioned, uh, companies like Splunk and HashiCorp, yes. they're living in a multi-cloud environment, exactly. so yeah. I, I shouldn't need to think about for some of them, oh wait, is it hybrid cloud, you know, public cloud A or my no. data center, things like right. that. I'm going to have that common tooling and skill set exactly. across those environments. Right. Because all the CIOs that we talk to, I mean, multi-cloud is part of, big part of their strategy, and they want to make sure that they have consistent security posture, whether it is on-prem, whether it is yeah. on multi-cloud, or like consistent like governance model across across. Yeah, that's a good point. Cloud. I want to get your thoughts on that because multi-cloud and hybrid, which both mentioned, is interesting. What we were saying in our opening segment just yeah. earlier, multi-cloud is a business problem. It's what you have. It's a situation. Yes. Hybrid is technology. You're implementing new things for an operating model that hits core to what happens in your environment, whether it's software development, application awareness, network automation. So they're two different things, but they're kind of related, right? Correct. So you nail hybrid with public-private or public on-premise, then, then multi-cloud can be dealt with. This seems to be where you guys are fitting in, right? Because you can do the hybrid public, then yeah. you connect, just that's the outcome of the no. software. You, you're spot on, right? It's People use it and sometimes it means the same and sometimes really not. And it's really, hybrid cloud is really around how can I extend my data center to a public cloud infrastructure, right? And that's more of a technology discussion. What do I need to do to make that happen? And then there's the multi-cloud discussion is really around how do I have consistent policy because I want to I wanna get to a situation where I don't have to worry. Uh, and so I can deploy this, you know, I can describe this one and deploy wherever I want it. And so you're right, there are two distinct things that need to happen. But I do, sorry, I do want to come back to your comment because <laughs> I can't have the energy there. What to use this, use this comment there, right? I mean, for half these, these application developers that want to use tools like uh, Terraform um, or Jenkins or Ansible, Ansible or Splunk, all of them expect that they have an API and they expect actually a network API. What they all prefer to have is something that makes sense from an application construct perspective. And so that's where I was, we have to put something in place to make that work, right? Was it day one all there? Uh, that the application team could jump? Clearly not, but it's very clear. I mean, if I look, we are now, what, six years into this? If I look back, I think it really jolted the market and I think it got everybody moving uh, in that direction. Yeah, and again, when we use the term application-centric infrastructure, the whole purpose is it is conducive to deploy applications faster and manage applications better. That's why, right? Yeah. Okay, uh, wonder if you can uh, dig in a little bit on the 400 gig. Tell us, you know, <laughs> it's not just the next step function. We're, we're, we're trying to go more to the applications. Uh, you talk about these changes, so what do people need to understand about 400 gig? You know, what's the same? What does this unlock for me? Does this tie in with all my Wi-Fi 6 and 5G and <laughs> everything else that I'm doing? And uh, you know, w w where and when is it this most uh, important? Well, let me let me take it maybe on 400 gig. Uh, a, it is available in shipping. Uh, a little sneak preview, we're actually going to have a customer with us on Wednesday talking about what they do with 400 gig awesome. in their European data center as a French customer. Um, 400 gig is really, it's an evolution. I mean, the way I look at it is, right, I mean, we had one gig, 10 gig, 40, 100, 400, right? It's, it's literally an evolution. And we're always looking back and saying, well, do you really need that much bandwidth? Then, you know, you, a little later you know when you ask that question, like you look like you missed it. Um, where is it deployed today? Service provider, mm -hmm. no doubt around. It's all in the service provider space. It's primarily what we call the large scale cloud providers, but also the initial uh, more telco DCs are looking at this uh, as a evolution. How do we build 400 gig? The way we approach this is, this is not something special. Everything that we do today around ACI, everything we do around analytics, 
has to work, right? Because customers are not building around speeds. Customers building around the operational model and whatever they have has to work. Just because I've given them a 4X speed, that has to work the same way. And so 400 gig for us is really an extension of what we have and you will see it. It plugs in directly. So can I build a 400 gig ACA fabric? Yes you can, if you want to. <laughs> With all that horsepower, obviously the next logical question that comes to my mind is, okay, faster means more data. That means more potential fat finger mistakes on configuring, but if you automate that away, you yeah. need AI, right? So analytics and AI become interesting to that. What's, how does that fit into the customer journey when they go, okay, I'm getting, going faster. If I'm application aware, is there an analytics angle in this? Ah, uh, yes there is. No, yeah. you're absolutely right. I think uh, based on the survey that we received, I mean, US corporations are spending billions of dollars in, due to the IT outages, right? And most of those outages are human errors, right? 43% uh, of the IT corporations are like spending 43% of their time in troubleshooting those outages. So I think it is very, very important as the data center are scaling, as the fabrics are getting automated, is that we equip them and provide yeah. them with the operation tools that can look smartly and proactively predict the network changes. They can assure that intent, the business intent has been translated into the network and proactively tell them that what are the problems they might run into and when they run into the problems, also intelligently explain it to them that what is the correlation of the events that they see on their log files and what is the root cause of the problem, right? Yeah, you get a lot of, you get a lot of data to work with there. Exactly. And experience, right? That's where the predictive analytics That's where it is. And so maybe let me expand a little bit. So I, I started off as saying we have this interesting extension of Network Insight, which is precisely that, what Yusuf just elaborated on. It's, it's really an engine that takes yeah. telemetry data, and we're going actually one step further than everybody else that I know. Everybody talks telemetry, but they're talking about like software telemetry, network state. We actually can marry that up with actual traffic data at real time, and we can give you that correlation. And now I'm getting actually where you can think I'm kind of going yeah. to is, I can actually tell you what's the root cause between why do I have a congestion, why do I have a problem, and who is impacted and who causes this, and I can actually predict the stuff. I can actually see this before it happens and now yeah. help a customer. I can look at other customer experience and I do really more as for machine learning. Yeah, yeah. There's really an opportunity there. We just, we're just scratching the surface, if yeah. you ask me. I mean, yeah. there's so much because, upside. I mean, historically speaking, if you look at it, I mean, we had all the show commands in the world which can tell you that what the ASIC registers look like, what yeah. the yeah. cam utilization is, but the correlation or the time-based correlation was missing in terms of when you, you are seeing some traffic degradation, you don't know whether yeah. it is drop, drop on yeah. what switch, which type of uh, traffic is getting affected. Now we have the ability to and using ML and AI techniques to correlate these events and give you a meaningful picture back to the customer so you can pinpoint that, look, my video tra traffic on switch number five is getting affected because there is a drop in the output buffer because my link is congested. Right? And that only works if you have quality data. It's not so much volume. Volumes, I mean, you get a, you get, the faster you go, Facebook and these guys prove it. Yeah. You need yes. to use machine learning, but yes. if the data is good, then the outcomes are better exactly. on the predictive. You, you need to have the flow data. If you don't have it, there's nothing yeah, yeah. you can do. So. so Scale is something we talk a lot about in the network. Yes. When I walk through the show floor, I'm starting to see some of the small scale, because we're talking about edge computing, yes. talked about shrinking down some of the things we're doing. When I hear telemetry data and AI and everything, I'm like, oh, here's some big opportunities that we need to attack at the edge. So, you know, what can you tell us about where, where, where your group is uh, with, with some of the edge pieces? Well, I interesting, I actually just came out of the uh, a service provider opening session. And I was there, was together with a, a T-System actually on stage, who is a customer of ours, who's using actually an ACI fabric together with a CVM environment, which is like a virtual uh, infrastructure management on x86. And they're using that in a, in a taco cloud environment, and clearly as an interconnect for networking services, and it's going to move, if you look at what they have in mind, moving it more to edge services, and that's an SP example that we have today deployed. But clearly, I think you're going to see this in enterprises, uh, you see this pretty much in every customer base, right? Because what you do have is you have to trade off between, do I want to get all my data back centrally, or do I want to compute on the edge? And what we have put in place with our, with our ACI fabric, I can run this in a highly distributed and still scalable environment, managed centrally with policy. So, not yeah. only is this actually where we think the world is going, we actually have customers doing this. Yeah, I think it's a tell sign too, and I think just my final question for you guys is, and we've been saying, I've been saying this in the cube with the team, is cloud helps everybody if hybrid kicks in, which we now has proven that yeah. hybrid cloud is a reality, that's what's going on, technically, yeah. operationally, if you, buy, if you believe that, then 
you, you go to the next level, which is cloudification value. So I want to rattle off, off some keywords for you guys, and I want you to respond to them. So, cloudification of networking. Network as a service, WAN to cloud versus internal, SD-WAN, simplification at the edge, BGP, <laughs> security and networking, common <coughs> policy. It's a lot of technology, so, gooby goob. <laughs> that's all sounds complex, but it's got to be simplified. What's your reaction to that cloudification? How does that kind of direction package itself out for the benefit of customers? Because there's a lot in there, right? SD-WAN there, alone. There is a lot in there, so. Yeah, my simplify easy way it. I look at this, it's, in the end, it's a business. It's that simple, right? And what's going on, you want to generate more revenue, more services, which is where the profit and the money comes from, and you have to scale, which means more service individually, uh, more scale how many customers you're going to deliver to, how fast you can roll this out, without having your cost going up the same way. And that's really in the end what it comes down to, at least in my book. And then you make your decisions what you're going to pick, right? How do I figure out how to develop an app faster? Maybe you're going to go to cloud. Uh, to start cloud first to develop, and then you figure out, oh, I need to hit a certain scale, I'm going to start having it running here and running here, my dev here, my production here, I need to connect it. But all of these things in the end coming down, how do you roll out services faster without my cost actually going up, but preferably staying flat or going down? So business model. It's, it's a business problem, it's what it is. Yeah, Thoughts? and I think from my perspective, uh, I mean, it is about us building tools to the cust yeah. for the customer so that we can simplify the whole process for them, right? Yeah. So that these multi-cloud can be treated as another site. I mean, whether you are deploying yeah. it on-prem, whether you're deploying in AWS or Azure, these are different sites to you, yeah. and you don't, have, as a user, have to worry about the nuances of AWS versus Azure versus IBM versus on-prem. You should be able to say that this is my intent, deploy it in AWS, deploy it in on-prem, and be able to move the workloads accordingly. So if I extract what you guys just said is, if the hybrid and cloud equation operationally solves itself, technically yep. and you know, with software and automation, all that stuff, the business issues, the app develop, basically the apps, yeah. drive everything. Absolutely. That's, well, a, that's a good that's, summary. That's the nirvana, I mean, how far are, are we going to hear some of that on the show this week? Absolutely. I think you're going to hear yeah. some of these pieces, actually. How are we tying together, and this is like, how are we tying together business intelligence with infrastructure yeah. intelligence? I think you're going to hear some of it. And the, you know, the good trend for the data center business is that the edge can look like a data center, too. The, the data center is everywhere the data is. That is our mantra, and so that means we're everywhere. Okay, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Really appreciate yeah. your insights. Great to have you on. Thanks yeah. for joining us. Appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thank, Thank you very much again. I'm Jeff Ward, Stu Miniman. This is theCUBE kicking off day one. Cisco Live 2020 in Barcelona, Spain. Thanks for watching.